60 different ethnic groups inhabit its coasts, jungles, savannas, and deserts. Masked spirits dance before expectant audiences in a show of strength. They are both loved and feared. Magic, mystery, myth, and the constant sound of the tam tam. forest canopy, keeping tradition alive. Ivory Coast, the African epic continues. in Ivory Coast. The wooded savanna takes on a ghostly feel. Northerly winds whip in, bringing large quantities of suspended dust derived from the sands of the Great Sahara Desert. Like a specter in the fog, the Vatican Basilica rises up. No, this is no hallucination. It is the Basilica of Our Lady of Peace, located in Yamosucro, near the center of the country. This was the dream of Ufue Boigny, the first president of Ivory Coast, who governed from the time of the country's independence until his death in 1993. of work on which the president squandered a large part of his fortune. Except for its superior dimensions, it is an exact replica of St. Peter's Basilica. 1,500 laborers work day and night in order to complete construction in three years. This drawing shows the colossal dimensions of this building as compared with the Vatican Basilica. Construction was overseen by Lebanese architect Pierre Facori. The religious complex, which features a replica of St. Peter's Square, complete with Bernini's colonnades, was finished in 1989. It was consecrated by Pope John Paul II in 1990 on his third visit to the country. One hundred and twenty-eight Doric columns, thirty meters high. Seven hectares of marble brought in from Italy, France, and Spain. And 7,400 square meters of stained glass make up this monumental building. But it is always empty. The locals have other beliefs and other gods to see to. There was much criticism during construction. In a country as poor as this one, it was considered a lavish waste, especially considering the fact that Catholics are a small minority compared to Muslims and those who practice traditional religions. The church's interior can seat 7,000 worshipers. There are speakers and air conditioning vents in every pew. Beneath the baldachin that presides over the gigantic presbytery, there is a cross of solid gold weighing 50 kilograms. Not the best way of convincing the Africans that Jesus Christ was as poor as they are.
One of the 42 large stained glass windows shows the arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem. Kneeling next to the donkey carrying Jesus, we see President Ufue Buanyi dressed as an apostle. On the left, wearing period tunics, are Pierre Fakuri, the Lebanese architect of the basilica, and his assistants, all of whom are shown welcoming Christ. We'll head to the north now, to Korhogo, the capital of the Senufo people. Sanufo villages are usually quite large. Groupings of various clans and families form what might be called neighborhoods. Most Sanufo are farmers, which explains the importance of barns here. This is where grain is stored throughout the year. The main crops include millet and corn, although the role of rice, which can be bought in Korhogo, is becoming more important in their diet. The Senufo people are one of the groups in Western Africa that is most profoundly tied to its customs and traditional codes. The Poro Society, which oversees the group's initiation system, is a lifelong influence. Starting in childhood, various stages are completed marked by complicated initiation ceremonies. The main step takes place between puberty and adolescence. This initiation period is obligatory and lasts for seven years. Each class of initiates is said to be from the same kolobele, a tie that will bind them together forever. Dogs are quite important to the Sinufo, especially hunting dogs like these. They are fitted with collars made with woody vines to protect them from being attacked by forest vermin. On special occasions, as a substitute for the ancient practice of human sacrifice, the dogs are slaughtered and offered up to the gods of the Poro in clubhouses filled with fetish figures. They also raise livestock, hogs, goats, and cattle. Men are in charge of caring for the herds, which are vulnerable to attacks from predators at all times. The women keep busy milking the cows and goats. The woman is very important in Sanufo society. Her power is comparable to that of the man although it may not be quite as evident. The system of patrimonial and cultural transfer is matrilineal, which implies that women are the heads of each family. Even in the Poro society, women play a dominant role. For example, they are instrumental in the process of founding a new Sinzanga, or Poro society school. The chief of the school is determined by matrilineal descent. In the heart of each Sanufo village, there is a fetish house where masks and carvings of deities are kept. On the exterior facade, we see talismanic figures and symbols which represent Poro society. Each year, a new layer of straw is added to the roof. The fetishes must be well protected. This square is also populated by the judges' quarters. The house of death, where cadavers are brought and funereal rites are given, and the stones of truth. Defendants are seated upon these rocks while they are publicly interrogated and sentenced. Each
Each fetish house has a guard who watches over it and makes preparations for ceremonies. Perhaps the Sanufo are best known for their weavings. They continue to use traditional techniques to weave cotton cloth on their handmade looms. Their methods have remained unchanged for years. Craftsmen produce long strips of cloth each day, which are used to make canopies for a variety of purposes. The men's hands move with the quick dexterity that comes with time inserting the different colored threads that make up each design, each filigree. The sons of fathers and grandfathers who were weavers, they have inherited this art from time immemorial. Women do not use the looms. Instead, they are charged with spinning the cotton and dyeing the thread. <laughs> they also embroider and sew the strips of cloth together for the canopies. <laughs> Sanufo drawings and paintings are well known throughout the world. Picasso himself found them to be a source of inspiration for his cubist style. They draw with plant-based pigments. There are three main colors, red, ochre, and black, the latter of which only dyes the cloth when applied on top of the ochre. As if by magic, it spreads over the white surface without leaving its mark. Of course, here in Africa, this is hardly surprising. They paint with rudimentary iron drawing pens, and they do so without the aid of preliminary sketches. Their designs often conjure up visions of hunters and deities from the Poro society. These are symbolic drawings of the magical spirit world, which is also depicted through a type of dance known only to the initiates. The full cosmic view of the Sanufo people is captured on these cloths transcendence to the great beyond, and ties with the earthly and spirit worlds. Boloye embodies military skill and strength, and is personified by the panther. Every African ceremony, the Boloye has its private face and its public face. On special occasions, initiates do the dance of the Black Panther or Boloye in the village square. When the dance is performed publicly, each dancer represents a different Kolobene. They challenge each other with different steps and acrobatic movements that show off their training. The Sanufo believe in one god, called Kolotial, who gave life to the first human couple. These, in turn, had twins who were the first beings to be born of man. The Sanufo are their direct descendants. Ancestral spirits are situated between god and man, as are deities like the Python, a messenger from another world. 
The poro is one of the most complex philosophies of life in sub-Saharan Africa. Its strength and influence have fended off both Islam and Christianity, keeping the Sanufo culture almost entirely intact. Let's continue our journey toward the border with Mali and Burkina Faso, where we will meet the Lobi people. the wooded savanna, invaded by the Harmattan winds. The first Lobi villages make their appearance through the haze. Also known as Bilfo, the Lobi came here from neighboring Burkina Faso. They were nomadic hunters, but the arrival of firearms meant the end of hunting, and little by little they became sedentary. They crossed the border and settled in northern Ivory Coast, looking for new territory where they could raise millet, corn, and sorghum. Women do most of the planting and harvesting, while the men take care of clearing the land and preparing the fields. They are also in charge of barn raising. Barns are of utmost importance to the lobi. Their barns ensure sustenance throughout the year. Magical symbols are crafted on their walls in order to protect the grain within and scare away thieves. A little further to the north, we come to the most established of the Lobi people, having settled here many decades ago. Their villages are a bit anarchical, with no structure as such. Their houses, called sukalas, are quite special. These buildings are totally different from those built by other ethnic groups in Ivory Coast. The flat rooftops are used to dry millet and corn. These large adobe structures house several generations of the same family. A number of large wooden pillars hold up the beams for the upper floor. The walls are built not with adobe bricks, but with cakes of adobe that are put in place while the mud is still wet. This is one of the most ancient building techniques in Western Africa. As the families grow, they expand their sukalas, which can become incredibly large. Their thick walls protect inhabitants from the high temperatures, which are typical here during the summer months. The lobi specialize in woodwork, Ladders built for reaching rooftops and barn lofts are nothing more than a series of rungs and supports. But lately, they are bringing high prices on the international African art market and being sought out by eager designers from the Western world. The ground floor of each sukala is used to keep livestock and domestic tools. The rooms are quite large especially the kitchen, which includes a small patio which provides an outlet for the smoke from the fireplace. An opening in one of the kitchen walls leads to the family sanctuary. This is where the ancestral fetish figures are kept, a spot which is off limits to those outside of the family. The lobi also make their own ceramics, which are fairly rudimentary. They are quite functional and plain. No turntable or wheel is used. As we were filming in this village, 
was an unexpected turn of events. A nine-year-old boy died after being bitten by a poisonous snake, and locals immediately began to carry out the death rites in a spontaneous manner. The women gathered at the child's house. With their hands atop their heads in a gesture of grief, they cried and raised their arms to the sky, pleading for consolation from the ancestral spirits. In Africa, death has a different meaning. Its religious transcendence goes far beyond the end of human existence. The spirits of the deceased go on living in another dimension that runs parallel to that of the living, and they have an influence on this world. That's why it is so important to see them off appropriately and maintain the balance. The drums begin to sound. In Africa, there is always music. The women dance to the rhythm of the drums. It is their way of calming down. grief for the dead. This is difficult for us Westerners to understand. In this way, they are showing the spirit of the deceased how much he was loved and how very sad they are. It is quite important that the spirit notices that they are saying goodbye. If he doesn't go in peace, he might come back and make trouble for the living. This is the eternal Africa, which once again shows us its strength, its mystery, and its magic. Now our journey turns towards the south, where the influence of Islam is deeply rooted. in Ivory Coast is located in Kong. It was built by Samori Touré, a Malinke chief. The architecture mixes elements from Northern Africa with the local style. This mud brick structure is reinforced with beams of palm wood. It was built using the classic religious architecture of the African Sahel the best example of which is the Mosque of Genet in Mali. Its walls, which are more than one meter thick, protect the interior from extreme daytime temperatures. Aside from its architectural singularity, the Kong Mosque is also unique because of the strange beings that have colonized it from the time of its construction. Thousands of bats hang peacefully from its hundred-year-old beams. For the people of Kong, these are sacred animals. In spite of their sinister appearance, these small mammals are actually beneficial to humans because they feed on mosquitoes. The downside is that the devout Muslims have to put up with their strong smell as they gather for Friday prayers. Our journey now continues to the south as we head toward Akan territory. The great savanna is burned. Every year in August, thousands of hectares are set ablaze by locals to eliminate dry, unproductive pastures. The dead plants release nutrients, which are then returned to the soil. The earth makes way for new plant life that will come with the rainy season. Many animals depend on this practice for their very survival. 
In other cases, it is poachers that set fire to the forest, hunting the animals as they flee from the blaze. When the rains begin, the forest is reborn. There are those who speak out against these practices for the high quantity of contaminating gases that are released into the atmosphere. Night falls on Akan territory, and the forest spirits reign. Anyi <laughs> women begin their invocation ceremonies for the curing of the sick the majority of whom are victims of magical spells. Witchcraft is quite strong here, and everyone believes in its existence. The illnesses are psychosomatic in nature. People fall ill because of the panic produced by the belief that they've been put under a spell. In the temple square, women dance to the rhythm of the drums as they await the arrival of protective spirits, which will give them the ability to cure and exercise those who have been put under a spell. After being cleaned and anointed, the sick are led to the courtyard, where they will receive treatment from those entities that have been called upon. After hours of frenetic dancing to the drumbeat, it is time for trances and possession. The friendly spirits are finally here. Serpent girls, 
as practiced by the dam and the gear. Each step is evidence of the depths of Africa. Although foreign influence is growing by the day, there is a profound underlying feeling of tradition beneath each and every modern element. The girls pass by running their thumbs along knife blades without moving a muscle and being thrown into the air in risky acrobatic feats. They are handed over by their families so that they can be trained in this dangerous discipline. They believe that they are possessed by a spirit that protects them and lends them the courage they need to undertake these acts. When they turn seven or eight years old, they leave the group and return home with a portion of their earnings. Thai National Park in southwestern Ivory Coast between Guinea and Liberia is known for being one of Africa's last virgin rainforests. There are still stable populations of chimpanzees in these forests, and the first archaeological evidence has been found of Stone Age chimps, with ruins dating back some 4,300 years. In the heart of the jungle, we come upon the Ubi, a people who express themselves through painting. The facades of their houses are decorated with scenes from daily life, religious deities, animals from the forest, and abstract magical concepts. The Ubi are a subgroup of the Kru people from neighboring Liberia. Currently, hunting practices are restricted by national park authorities, but traditionally, members of these ethnic groups have always been great hunters. They achieve their dignity when they capture their first panther, the animal around which a large part of their mythology revolves. The drawings change over time. Others remain and are repaired and protected because of their religious significance. Women take care of domestic chores and care for the children. Ubi food staples include grain, rice, fish, game meat, and livestock. When preparing meals, they use the oil obtained by cooking up a paste they make by grinding up the fruit of the makori with a mortar and pestle. The oil is unrefined, with a strong acidic flavor. Rice is the main staple in their diet, and like other ethnic groups in Ivory Coast, they buy it in the city. They also raise it, but only in small quantities, which does not allow them to be completely independent. In addition to taking care of daily chores, women play a very important role in the Ubi social structure. As with the majority of the many ethnic groups living in Ivory Coast, women establish secret societies which have a decisive influence on village life. Today, several women have come from Abidjan, the country's capital, to try and convince the council to abandon the practice of female genital mutilation. In the last few years, associations have been founded to fight for the eradication of this barbarous custom. But it is no easy task. They have to call on the spirits and speak with them about this delicate matter. The ones dressed in white are in a trance. It is through them that the spirits will make their opinions known. Can young women be initiated without undergoing female circumcision? Dance is a way of fraternizing and creating a relaxed atmosphere. This subject usually creates a lot of tension. For the older women, even talking about it is taboo. This village has just finished the initiation of a group of girls. 
After spending an extended period of time in isolation in the forest, the girls were subjected to genital mutilation. They also learned traditional codes, esoteric secrets, and how to be a good wife. Today, they will dance in the village square. spirits of nature who live within the jungle. The same spirits who use woody vines to construct the bridges which appear at sunrise. They are not the work of human hands. The supernatural forest beings build these bridges to ease the way for humans who live in the jungle. Hundreds of vines, the jungle's resistant entrails, are woven together by the spirits in the dark of the night. As day breaks, a new bridge spans a river or levels a steep incline. only to see that the bridge has vanished as mysteriously as it appeared. Dan villages are usually quite large. Their circular houses are covered with a pointy cone-shaped roof made of palm leaves, an effective method given the heavy rainfall in the region. They paint the facades with clan-related emblems and magical symbols related to the gore a fundamental set of laws that link human existence with the divine essence of the ancestral world. Each village in Ivory Coast has a piece of land in the nearby rainforest where the spirits of the dead live. Each group has its sacred forest, a spot which is off limits to outsiders. Those who are about to be initiated take shelter in the sacred forest, practicing circumcision, speaking through masks that symbolize wisdom, and handing down justice. The gluer mask is worn for peacemaking purposes. It has tubular eyes and a large mouth and is used to resolve problems of justice and significant questions affecting the community. These decisions are final. All those who disobey are punished and die as a result of being poisoned by the secret Boer Society executioners.
the women pay tribute with an upbeat dance. This brand of theater is passed down from generation to generation. It is a natural way of communicating with the jungle gods. The Dan are excellent percussionists. From a very young age, they beat their drums, which can be heard at all times for a variety of reasons. Coast belong to the Gare ethnic group. 
These are veritable institutions which govern, legislate, and determine social codes for the villages that stud the western region of Ivory Coast. Each mask pertains to a different family. Some are quite old and are brought out only on special occasions. The masks appear only so often, with five years, 10 years, or even 50 years between appearances. They represent the protective spirits that are revealed in dreams. Their importance can be seen in their decorative elements and in the group of the initiated which accompanies each one, charged with caring for and guiding it. Before bringing the mask outside, complex ceremonies are performed in which animal sacrifices are made. They are respected and feared by the people, who derive strength and spiritual peace from them. Fortuitous physical contact with them must be avoided. If the mask does not grant its permission, no one outside the group of initiated can touch it. There are masks of justice, of wisdom, war, and satire. Each one corresponds to a specific need. The dances are always spectacular, proving that the power of the mask's magic comes from the great beyond. Only the initiated know who has been chosen by the family chief to perform the mask dance. Before donning the costume and the carved wooden mask, the dancer enters into a deep trance which will last until he returns. Once it is brought out, each mask is given a certain amount of time, between two and four days, to return to its secret dwelling. Before being put away, the correct sacrifices and rituals must be undertaken.